Welcome to The 20 Podcast, bringing you interviews with the best DJs, producers, and music industry professionals from around the globe. I'm your host, DJ Spider. DJ Spider. That's right. I am here. DJ Spider, hanging with you. Thank you guys for sticking with me every week. Listen to this. Help me build the community. I appreciate it. We are almost up to episode 80. And I'm so proud of this. I'm so proud of what we have built together. This podcast is brought to you by BeatSource. BeatSource is the new digital music service for open format DJs. We have got so much stuff popping. Offline locker mode is in effect. We got BeatSource link. You're able to DJ off the cloud with everybody going back into work now. Now is really the time to put that to use. We got that 30 day free trial. We got VIP crates. We got the web based DJ app. We've got tractor integration. We got all of our playlists constantly being updated. So much great stuff. So go check out BeatSource. And now let me tell you about my weekend. I actually did something. (laughs) I know that's weird to hear. I had a great weekend. So much fun. I'm like still buzzing from it. Um, I got to DJ for the first time in a while uh, outside of my house. I got to DJ a drive-in event. Uh, It was a drive-in theater event for HBO where I DJed before this screening of a TV show that they made called Mayor of Easttown with Kate Winslet. So much fun. All of my Twitch skills came into play because I had to get on the mic a ton. Uh, They asked me to play a set that was very specific. They wanted me to play a set that was inspired by strong female voices as well as Philly musicians. So you know what I did. I went in. I went really hard on that. I had so much fun putting that together. Um, I'll see if I can somehow uh, make a playlist that mimics what I did uh, and post it on BeatSource for you guys. Uh, I was allowed to invite friends, so I had some friends come, come to the drive-in, and actually, the guest on today's show uh, had told me that he made music for this show. I invited him, and he came through, so it was so amazing to see him there, up in the front row, honking, flashing his lights, um, and it was just so amazing for me to be out there DJing again. I can't tell you the feeling I got. It was so great. So I can't wait to do it again. I've got some super exciting stuff lined up. Just today, I got a phone call that was unbelievable. Uh, Looks like I might be out in Vegas this weekend and got some really big, cool stuff coming up. So I'm excited for what's to come summer of 2020 and beyond. Shout out to all you guys out there that are starting to work again. And if, if you're not, just keep your head up. We will be out there all doing it again soon. Now back to the guest we have on today. He's one of the funniest, most talented, nicest guys around. His career has had so many twists and turns from making underground hip hop and styles of beyond to touring the world with Fort Minor, uh, becoming a touring DJ himself after that at all types of nightclubs around the nation and probably around the world. He went on the road with new kids on the block. He DJed on cruise ships with them. I mean, the stories are unbelievable, he tells us. He went on to create his own TV and music Uh, TV and movie music licensing and composing agencies, The Math Club, uh, and now he is on to his new venture. He's created Stupid Fly Media, uh, and at first, right now, they are kicking it off by producing some amazing podcasts, and I know I have my own podcast recommending other podcasts, but you really should listen to Fresh Era, the first one he put out. It's great. I was very impressed, and I loved it. Um, He also is well known uh, as someone who's brought the DJ community together and he did that with his event Fire Poo and his award show. And yes, you heard the name right, Fire Poo. So just keep listening and you will understand. His stories are hilarious and insightful and I had so much fun with him. I did not want this episode to end. So please welcome to the show the amazing DJ Cheap Shot. All right, you guys, we've got him on. It's DJ Cheap Shot. Give it it up what up y'all yeah oh look at you with the howard stern sound effects there he, he's here he's here everybody feeling it up feeling myself yeah we're here finally man i've been a fan of your show this whole pandemic i've been like listening and enjoying and learning about my friends and yeah. and uh i was That's such true. a fan i hit you up like i've never you know, I started thinking about, you know, trying to get myself out there more uh, to promote Stupid Fly, but you were the first and only person I thought of, but I've never 
been the guy to ask like i never asked friends to like can i sleep over your house this weekend as a kid so i'm like <laughs> you know and so with you i was like shit i really want to be on his show but i don't know if you're supposed to ask if you can book yourself so well don't don't uh don't give anybody out there ideas no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> everyone's gonna be hitting you up dude can, can i sleep over your house this weekend so cheap shot paid me to have him on uh <laughs> and to wear this shirt was a bonus uh extra Dude. for all the youtube people looking at us um he paid me a lot to put this shirt on and uh while we're no. looking at it i want to tell you the secret <laughs> sauce of that logo want to, can i tell you why we chose that logo the meaning behind it yes which you uh, may for everybody notice. listening i'm wearing the stupid fly uh shirt which is his new media company so yeah tell us about it i, I love the this logo so the logo, like what people don't see, I, you know, the FedEx logo or uh, yeah, FedEx, where you could see the arrow between the Fed and the X or Baskin Robbins says 31 in the B and the R. Um, stupid yes. fly. When you look at us, if you look at the black line on Spider's shirt, it is a fly swatter. Huh? Oh, uh -huh, uh -huh. look at that. Oh, my God. So, boring you know for the listeners, but fun for the viewers. There we go. <laughs> That, yes. that deserves one of those. Um, <laughs> getting into my sound effects today. That's, <laughs> You're hard. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, oh, wow. Jada just gave us something. So, yo, that's so good. I, I never realized the FedEx thing was a was a arrow till like a couple of years ago, I feel like. Yeah, me too. Like all this whole like high level corporate branding, like some of it yeah. looks so mediocre, but when you look beyond, like I don't Damn. know if you've seen the new Baskin Robbins, but the 31, no. it's like... It, it, so the B is the three, and then the, wow. the leg of the R is one. So it, it still has the 31 flavors in there. Crazy. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I'm, I'm going to look it up. Didn't know that. And uh, I like your logo even more now. It also is reminiscent of something that I can't put my finger on, but I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. Uh, Public Enemy. They, okay. their logo is very similar. I didn't realize until after we were already in motion, uh, where someone was like, you're copying that. And I'm like, no, we're not. And then they showed me the thing and I was like, oh yeah, we are. But, uh, and then, but it was inspired also just the, the simple black and white from the, um, parental advisory stickers of the nineties. So we were just right, like, right. it all, it all played together very well. Oh my God. I love it. So great. Well, I mean, you guys went all out, um, like you know with the whole stupid fly and th uh fresh era and all the stuff actually look at this guys everyone on youtube i got a bag he sent me from dr stupid fly and then in the bag is what i think are m ms i didn't eat it just in case it was like weed candy or something i'd be super <laughs> high but um <laughs> i'm like are they saying am i gonna eat this and be like mm, i got cotton mouth i can't talk to my family <laughs> till tomorrow um, but then after listening to your promos, I understood it's the cure for CHDS, which uh, you're like the amount of dope ideas and promo you put into all of your stuff around it. I'm listening to uh, Sun Doobie from Funk Dubious do the most hilarious commercial for CHDS and Chub Rock and uh, like, you know, all the stuff, the stickers and an air freshener for my car. I mean... This, you, you're killing it. You're killing it. And oh, thank the, uh, you. The way you did the um, all the shows and describe them, so very inspirational, very cool. And also, what is CHDS? Do you want to tell the listeners out there? Yeah. So, so uh, Stupid Fly was basically built out of my own personal need uh, to get back in touch with myself from the '90s. Like I, I, I look back in the '90s so much, and I find in my '40s. You know, that's all I want to do. And, and, and I feel like hip hop content is, is really spread out and hard to find like the high quality stuff. And so I was like, right. I want to be sort of like the centralized location of high quality golden era hip hop stuff because I want it. And I hope that 10 billion other people want it too, but really I want it. And so, you know, thinking about like, I'm just kind of waking myself up from an adulthood coma. Like we all find our careers and, you know, have kids and, you know, kind of lose a bit of yourself in your older age. And, uh, so I called that like an adulthood coma and I was like, well, I'm curing that. And let's call CHDS the classic hip hop deficiency syndrome. And, uh, that's what led to all the promos. I was like, it'd be funny to make it sound like one of those 90s like uh uh what do you call it like 
uh, you know, like, like, yeah, like Pfizer or, you know, when Viagra <laughs> first came on the scene, you know, those really like depressing, <laughs> but they try to make it like sunshine and roses. Those like, um, yeah, Ooflifia or whatever, you know, on the daytime yeah. television spots. It's so, like, if your all. erection lasts longer than two days, <laughs> then you've got a problem. Um, yeah. But like, meanwhile, the lady's like kicking up like flowers and daisies and, you know, with some sunshine background, you know, and it'll be yeah. like, the side effects uh, may be vomiting and death. And you're like, that's exactly. not... I don't want to take that. <laughs> I know. I know. That just, just off topic for one sec reminds me. I was looking through this book with my son because he wants to learn about the deadliest snakes in the world or something. And we're looking and one of them was like, <laughs> you know, causes this and that and you die and all this. And extended erections that like cannot go away. And I'm like, what the hell kind of snake is this? Like, <laughs> like hook like, me up. Yeah, exactly. It's like the Viagra cure. Also, you, I mean, so it's going to kill you and you're going to just have an endless boner. They're like, we found him. He's been killed by the snake. He's got a huge raging heart on. Like, what the hell is going on? That's a, that's a crazy snake. Thanks, God. It's a way to go out, though. That. A way to go out, though. <laughs> so then these are just real M&Ms or fresh air. Those are just M&Ms. And you have my personal guarantee. I, actually, okay. the most expensive thing one. we've... Yeah, yeah. Guaranteed You're, M&Ms. It, it's on the damn... I don't have a nice enough camera to zoot to, uh, to to focus. So there you go. But on it is the logo. So I mean, and that month. shit is expensive. You could anyone could go on Eminem's sure. website and press up their own branded uh, Eminem, and the idea was so. It was like a good thought, like we're going to make these medicine bottles look like CHDS uh, pills. But then yeah. I only ordered. I, I wanted to press up a hundred boxes. And then I ordered 20 pounds of M&M's. Doesn't that sound like enough? Sure. <laughs> I needed I 100 pounds. I had to order. a So, so oh 20 God. pounds was, I want to say like, uh, you know, $80 a bag. So $80 for two five pound bags. And I had to go <laughs> then. So now I'm already like pot committed. And when I realized that I could only fill up 10 bottles with 10 pounds, I had to go buy 80 more pounds. And it was like $1,000 for M&Ms. <laughs> wow. It was that's, the worst. That's a lot. Um, all right. Well, thank you. I'm going to cherish each one that I eat. They're, they're good. <laughs> they don't taste old or anything. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Good. You can, um, I know, eventually you can partner with like weed brands, send out some blunts and 40s, uh, get some old English, St. Ides uh, sponsorship on the show. Yeah, now Something we're talking. Like <laughs> now we're talking. We can, I can help you get into that. Um, no, well, I, I love it. Thank you for all the swag and all the stuff that uh, you sent over. And, um, you know, for... We've known each other for a long time. There's so much stuff for us to talk about on this episode. I'm almost scared that it could go for six hours. So I'm going to try to hone us in uh, to a certain point. But the thing we're speaking about now is, like we said, some, your most current project. You've done so much and so many cool things over the years. And at this point, um, you are doing, you've created this company, Stupid Fly Media, like you said. You've got this podcast um, called Fresh Era, which I'm not just here to give you props on everything, you know, endless props, but I, oh my God, I can't recommend enough that people out there should listen to this podcast and not just because you're on the show and we're friends. It is so good. If I didn't know you and I heard this podcast, I would still be sending it to my friends and going, you got to hear this. You know, the people that made this are on the same wavelength as us and put in so much work. So it's, it's just put together so good. It's almost like a television show in an audio format or an old school radio show. Um, but with new sensibilities, I only listened to the Chub Rock episode so far, full disclosure, but it's so good. I can't believe it's only 30 minutes. I mean, these shows will last two hours and your show within 30 minutes was like a movie. It was so amazing. So do you want to talk a bit about, you already said kind of how it led you there, but do you want to talk a bit about what you have going on with Stupid Fly Media, what your goal is with it and what Fresh Era is about and then the other shows that you have coming? Yeah, let, let's uh, let's get the plugs out of the way because I like you, man. Like we've we've known each other for so long. I would love to talk about you know whatever you find most interesting, and your you know your your listeners do too. So I'll just plug. Oh, fresh air. To me, this is great. Uh -huh. I mean, even just your ideas with the promo, I think everybody out there will get a lot out of. You know what I mean? This is and it's cool to see 
a DJ that's the same as us from day one doing this and going into these different ways. So um, to me, it's yes, we're plugging it, but it's not like this isn't a forced plug. A lot of people come on here and I, we don't need to talk about their stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting to me. I, I think you're doing a great job. So I'd love to hear about it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, basically Fresh Era, um, I... It, I, so I own a music company that calls it's called Math Club Music, and we make music for film and television. And uh, around 2016, I had this epiphany of going and finding my idols from the 90s to record rap songs that sound like they're from the 90s to sort of fill this void in the sync community because um, old school hip hop is hard to clear. So I met them, started recording with them. They're telling me these amazing stories that I always wondered. And it made me realize that like in the 90s, you only got these guys on, if you were lucky enough to catch UMTV raps, you'd get them for five minutes and they'd be, you know, in their most swaggerish position, bragging about whatever project they're working on. And you never really, like I realized in my 40s, I love their music and I was so inspired by them, but I never felt like I really got to know them. And so now that I'm in my 40s and a lot of these guys are in their 50s, I was like, People should know about them as people like we should preserve their legacies in a proper way. And I feel like um, a lot of the hip hop content out there is it's either long form, really hard to get through with the host kind of talking over them. And, you know, it's very stream of consciousness or the MCs talking about their new projects, which no disrespect to them is not as exciting to me personally as a fan uh, than their old stuff. So I was like, well. I, I love a good high quality podcast. What if I could kind of take these guys and bring them into a new light um, and reintroduce a lot of these deactivated family people and career people and, and, you know, put them back in the spotlight, you know, in, in podcast form. And, you know, we have plans to sort of transition out of podcasting down the road um, into films and short form and YouTube, all that stuff. But we had to start in podcasting because it's 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 the easiest and uh it's what we do best and so that is fresh era so i recommend people to go listen to fresh era and then um coming off the heels of that this summer is a is what we think is sort of like cutting edge but it's sort of this uh what we call a pot uh game cast which is a game show podcast that um is all 90s hip-hop trivia shout out to steve wonder i feel like i had this idea like years ago and then yeah. during the pandemic, I saw this questions thing, which Steve is murdering it with. And then I'm like, I, like I, at one point I was really worried because I was like, oh, I hope there isn't crossover. And then as, as they've really defined who they are, the questions hip hop, um, yeah. we, we also f finished our first season. And I think they're going to be this beautiful complementary product to each other. And, uh, and Steve actually asked me on the questions, which I think uh, is going to happen in a couple weeks. And then I want to oh, ask him on a uh, head spin and we can do this nice crossover co you know, co-promotion thing, which I think would be super cool. And I love Steve. So uh, that's yeah. going to come out next. Oh, that's that's a great idea. Yeah, the questions. Actually, I was one of the founding members of the questions. Uh, Get out of here. Yeah, Steve and Sean Kantrowitz, and uh, who's the host and writes most of a lot of the questions too. Um, and I, we would meet in Steve's condo in Sherman Oaks uh, years ago and just be planning this out and and you know, doing it live. We used to do it live at a bunch of different venues and at um, Blind Barber. So shout to Josh Boyd and, and the Blind Barber family had us doing it in Culver City and Highland Park. Um, and so we were doing it every month live for probably a couple of years before even the pandemic. And I would DJ. I hosted a couple of them, one of the, at Dre Day, uh, which that one kind of got crazy everyone was super drunk like running up towards me as i'm trying to host this live and i got somewhat overwhelmed um but um yeah such a great thing and they've really taken it to the to another level like as i've branched off and been doing my thing and and taking a step back from it they have taken it over and turned through the pandemic turned it into this amazing thing with instagram and tw uh, twitch and they have so many things they're doing with it going forward so yeah i'm excited to see the synergy between both of your guys shows uh, i think that's yeah. dope 
And what I also realized in this is like, it, it kind of like the DJ scene when I was still in, in networking in that industry was like, you, you, you see things what potentially are competition, but when you get to know someone, it's really just like, it's rather to better to know the people in the game and support each other than, than, you know, not know them and hate on them totally. because you think they're eating this food off your plate that they're not really even eating. There's enough yeah. food to go around. And I feel like when you watch TV, you could watch Jeopardy and then you could go switch over to who wants to be a millionaire. And you never think like consider like those are competitors. But I guess when you step out of it, you're like, oh, two game shows, trivia, da, 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 da. There's nuances between them. And I think like with the questions and head spin, there's a people will understand that like. I'll go there for my drive to work and then I'll watch questions when I get home from work. You know, like there's, it's all yeah. these different, there's enough of it out there for it to be shareable. Yeah, exactly. I think that applies to the DJ game. Like you said, a lot of DJs, it's like being a boxer or something. You're the only one you got to fight for yourself. But in reality, if you collaborate and network with other people, same within music production and all that stuff. Uh, like you said, there's enough to go around and you never know what could come out of the opportunity of knowing each other and helping each other. Uh, it's better to have pe like-minded people around you than just try to win everything in a way, you know, or D definitely do that thing. Um, that's yeah. dope. And then you have another show that do you want to talk about that one? Uh, coming you know, out, I don't or? like, I'll just okay. full disclosure is I have the third show on there and, um, it's called CDs nuts. And the idea was <laughs> to do these deep dive analysis. I don't even know how you call it. Uh, analysis <laughs> on like, uh, old school hip hop albums. But what's happening all of a sudden is you know, the, it's almost like the old school hip hop explosion is happening right now and we're getting in at the right time. But a lot of prominent, uh, podcasters are starting to do shows, uh, about the same thing. And, and oh. I'm always like, I like to go against the grain. I don't like doing things that other people are doing. And so right. we are sort of reworking CDs nuts. Um, okay. and so it, it may or may not happen. So, uh, but we do have other things coming. Um, we have a whole slate of content and, and spider, whether he knows it or not, is going to be a part of this. So, um, hey, um, that sounds good to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to, I'd love to, well, I love it. And even just the art, I mean, even if you don't do CDs nuts, the artwork is dope. <laughs> and this little well, th thanks, pam man. pamphlet you put together is, is pretty tight. <laughs> well, thank you. I felt like um, sending out a promo box for podcasts. It was hard for, you know, someone who may not know what a podcast is, you know, like I got to give them a, how do you say a lesson on what it is and make them feel like they got something tangible when you have a intangible product. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I think that, um, having such a forward thinking, approach to this where you said okay eventually we want to get into films and do all these other things but we want to start with podcasts because the easiest way to produce it is a cool way to think about it um, because in a way yeah you could start off by writing a book or doing a podcast which is almost the same thing at this point um, and then that can spark off into all the other things and show that you could produce these movies and connect with people through that so I can't yeah. wait to see where you guys take it. Oh, thanks, man. And you know what it's like in L.A. Everyone's like, I'm a producer of a film, but I didn't want to be the, another <laughs> yeah. one of those. And it takes millions of dollars to produce a film. And I'm like, well, I have all the audio gear and I love podcasts. And, you know, it, I'm, I'm talking to these guys anyhow. So it just seemed like the most natural, easiest place to start without being unrealistic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and so and yeah, and you've always loved making things. I mean, I've. There's videos from 10 years ago on the internet that is like a produced award show or, you know, you're in a suit giving speeches and there's credits and sounds. And, and that was well before you were even doing the music for TV and movies and stuff. So that's, that's kind of your thing. I mean, you used to do this um, thing that I was reminiscing on and thinking about in a way that I don't think this exists anymore in any capacity. Um, you had a, an event, I guess, called Fire Poo, which funny name, um, and has to do with uh, people eating hot wings and DJs coming together. Um, and then eventually it, it evolved into the Fire Poo Awards, which was actually a whole big <laughs> deal that everybody came to and i think i actually missed the award show unfortunately but i came to as many of the events as i could but watching back i i looked at a few of them on youtube seeing 
the DJs that were there was kind of mind blowing. I was like, wow, I forgot that we were all in the same room as all of these people of so many DJs and so many DJs that you see killing it out in the world today or killing it on Twitch or whatever they're doing. We're all there. And it was a place for us to come together where it wasn't us watching an artist promote their new single and we had to listen to it and go, yeah, I would play that in the club. Or it was really a place for DJs to come and be DJs and meet each other and sure network quote unquote, but just have fun and drink beer yeah. and eat wings and be themselves and get to know each other and not have to, you know, be like, I can't hear anything. So I'm going to be like, yeah, bro, that sounds good in the club right now because it's so loud, you know? <clears throat> so I, you know, that's, that's a great quality about you is you're, you're, you're a family man, not even just all about your family, but you love to make everyone your family and bring them together. And I think you do the same thing with your, your company. Now we'll talk about it, math club, but um, yeah, let's talk about the fire poo thing and, and the awards and all of that stuff. What yeah. brought you to that and the award show and, and all of those things. So, dude, first of all, thanks for remembering it and, and talking about it in such a high regard. It was one of my favorite things I've ever done in my life. And much like Stupid Fly, it came out of a personal necessity, right? I think all the successful things in my life have been out of something that I personally needed. And, and, and I think it, it is a lesson to other people is like, don't do other things because other people are doing them do something that you want and you need, especially in this nuanced sort of world where everyone can find a community online, you know? Um, so, so it taught me that lesson. It was the first of its kind uh, self teaching lesson or whatever, where um, right. uh, there was a, a, a dear friend of mine named DJ evil one, who I know you're friends with. He yes. was friends with me forever. And he moved down from Portland to LA and I'm, I'm a LA native. And he, because he forced himself into the DJ scene in Los Angeles, within a matter of months, he had like four or five weekly residencies in Hollywood. And meanwhile, I've been here my whole life and I was DJing way longer than he did. And I wasn't working in LA at all. And I remember like wondering, <laughs> like, why am I not working here? And then as I realized that like, all my friends are like state farm agents and like, you know, like they do other things and I'm not making real connections with the people in my community of, of work. And right. so, you know, I, to sound extra corny, I bought this book about networking called Never Eat Alone, which became my Bible. And I highly recommend it to anyone looking to build relationships, albeit a lot of it's creepy. I just kind of use the stuff that seemed less creepy. Um, <laughs> and he, he mentioned like, call someone you like in your business. And, and it was on a whim. I called Eric Deluxe, who was, who was a, a, a Power 106 DJ out here that I knew for a long time, but I never hung out with him. And I said, hey, man, you want to get some hot wings? And he, we, we shared hot wings together. And we drank beer together and we had a blast. And I woke up the next morning and usually after eating hot wings, I would sit on the toilet and cry. But the next morning when it was stinging, I, I, it brought a smile to my face. And like that sting made me realize how much fun I had. And I texted Eric Deluxe. I said, hey, we should do this again. But next time, let's invite everybody because I want to make friends with everybody. Why, why did it take me so long to become friends with my peers? And so, uh, fire poo, the name was born and I shot an email to every, so, so from that book, <laughs> it, it taught me that we yeah. all have these like kindergarten instincts and still do us like, what if nobody comes? What if people laugh at me? And really like that doesn't happen. And it, even if it does, it doesn't matter. Like who, ki who gives a fuck. Right. So I, I, I was like, you know, whatever, 50 DJs in my email. And I shot an, e an invite to everyone to this thing called Fire Poo at Buffalo Wild Wings in Burbank. Um, and my theory behind it was I, a couple things. And you could edit as much of this uh, out of, as you want. But basically, like, number one, I wanted to do it over hot wings and beer because if nobody showed up, it was still going to be me and my friend Eric Deluxe eating hot wings and drinking beer. So it's a win win. Like, you can come to the yeah. party and have, you know, or, or I will just have a beer and hot wings and hang out with my pal. Um, but then the other theory was, um, the other networking events that I've been to leading up to that was DJs, you know, 
they stand around. We're introverts by nature. And it's either going to the club, like you said, and screaming in your DJ friend's ear, which they don't want, you don't want, nobody, it's a lose, <laughs> like nobody has fun doing that. Like it right. might seem like it, but no one really has, you don't really bond in that way. And then the yeah. other like networking events outside the club seemed very serious. Like we need a DJ union. Uh, <clears throat> we hate those undercutting DJs. And so I was like, Let's, why don't we just have a good time and not talk about DJing and I will be the sacrificial lamb who I will create a program of me just standing up on chairs in dumb bar mitzvah suits, uh, trying to make people laugh. Um, but that will give people like something to talk about it, 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 that has, it's not music related. So I wanted to like create a space of DJs networking without talking about music and really getting to know each other. Um, because that's what I wanted. I don't like talking about music. I don't like talking about DJing. I just like doing it and then hanging out with friends when I'm not doing it. Um, yeah. So, so I, you know, the first one out of the 50 people I invited, 14 came. And I remember thinking to myself, like, well, I hate those other 35 people, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> but then I was like, I, uh, Twitter was just invented. I think it was like 2010 or 2009. And, um, uh, the, all the people that were there were on Twitter and they invited their friends. And I, I started getting emails like, when's the next one? When's the next one? When's the next one? And then, uh, me and DJ Stubbs, who is, who was my assistant, who is now blossomed into a beautiful, uh, young flower on his own. Um, <laughs> he was there helping me organize and, and, you know, kind of set up the next ones and all that to be said over time people were flying in from miami and dallas and seattle and new york and russell peters came and you know like all, all these all this crazy st uh, spin bad rest in peace my favorite dj of all time was spin bad and he showed up to one um god rest his soul he was he's the man um yeah and and um you know and uh, dj quick came to one and z trip came to a lot of them and kid sister the the girl who used to be signed to kanye you know like it yeah. just became this like hangout place and i would look around in like awe of all these people that i have been so either scared of because they have scary names like dj spider where you just assume he's going to be some <laughs> mean guy who makes fun of you all night uh <laughs> Or, or it's just like, you know, the people I, I was raised on where I'm like, wow, these people are coming. But when you break down that whole wall of, um, yeah, what do you call it? Like, like, you know, then you meet spider and you realize that all of us DJs are kind of like, Hey man, nice, nice to meet you. And they're funny <laughs> and they're, they're, they're approachable. And we're just a bunch of guys trying to do what we love to do for a living. And like, it's sort of a beautiful, it was a beautiful human experiment. And then I yeah. felt like, uh, once a year we should have this poopy award thing. And, um, the last <laughs> poopy award, which you could find on, on YouTube, uh, DJ quick accepted an award and he brought sugar free on stage. And, you know, it was like, we, we had like a real voiceover announcer announced the voice. We packed an entire theater on Wilshire Boulevard for the poopy awards. And that's the end of that spiel. That's amazing <laughs> the fact that you got dj quick and sugar free to come to an event called fire poo and i mean the poopy awards that's huge but really the the everything you said the sentiment behind it is huge you know and like i said i don't think anyone has done that that i know about at least in la uh for djs before or after it's all been based around some sort of brand or listening or record label or something which which is cool too but the the way that yours was so pure i think gives it the the charm and the specialness you know that it well, that it had <laughs> thanks man but for real like you were you know seeing you there it was and this isn't the blow smoke up each other's butt show but like you were a guy who was so respected in the industry and you you know hearing you and steve talk about the the hollywood scene kind of blowing up together and you guys were you know you were a unit together that sort of like helped each other out um yeah i i, I, I just remember always hearing your name uh and and being like damn i want to know this guy named dj spider and then, you know, uh, you came to Fire Poo and I just remember being like, man, this is so cool. People are trusting me in, in hosting this event. And now I get to meet some of these people that I was really like 
respect like I, I i respected you so much because i had heard your stuff before and I, I i went to clubs you were at and i just remember being like damn spiders here holy shit oh <laughs> shit like that it was i mean that's the crazy to hear because i was just like i'm coming to this fun thing and networking you know like hanging with everybody like not even thinking of networking but the also i loved how it brought together uh both genders you know because a lot of times like uh women djs are left out or it's considered or we're gonna do the ladies only event or things like that or everyone's just like you know djs are a bunch of dudes especially an event called fire poo probably might make some (laughs) girls go i don't know but there was a good amount of girls that went to that and still go to that and even when i asked uh do people want to ask you questions on the internet you know some women wrote in and asking about that so I think that was an important part of it too. It really brought the entire community, the uh, entire community together in a special way. Well, hopefully we could do it again. Like uh, in my head, uh, you know, a couple of years, I think just before the pandemic, Dazzler was kind of putting her feely, feelers out. Dazzler from Beat Source, as we all yeah, know and love, and we love she, Dazzler. And she was talking about po- potentially doing something at uh, the retreat, uh, your retreat. So, oh maybe yeah, the, that would maybe have been that will come back. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, maybe one day. And also, you just did it. I mean, you launched the way you launched your Fresh Era and you did the Fresh Era Fest. Uh, in a way, you brought together all those DJs uh, to do these Twitch streams for a week straight and do these raid trains. Um, just the the lineup on the day that I played, I think I had Trek Life um play before me who is someone that i've been making music with for over 20 years in like my parents garage and then into i raided into rob swift who's someone that i got to spend time with in beijing china djing out there and doing stuff and just the way it connected everyone then eric deluxe who's someone that i've known forever as well and uh, let me do one of my biggest sets on Power 106 and play this 12 Days of Mix Miss set that everybody talks about, and he's the host on the microphone for it. And, you know, we're all connected in this special way. So you even did it a couple weeks ago when you brought everyone together on Twitch, and I know Dazzler played a huge part in Snapback and Stubbs and all them. So yeah, uh, shout yeah, out to that- all you guys and the community that that has been built through the pandemic and that should continue, and I think that was part of it. Absolutely, man. Yeah, thank you. Um, but, but I do look back on fire pool, like, man, that was, if, if I die broke and lonely and sad, like I always will have fire poo to look back on and it brings a smile to my face. So thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so speaking of, uh, fire poo and, uh, things that come along with it, I was looking up different videos and trying to find things online and you and I have done videos together. We could talk about that later. I'll put a link to it, but I found a video from a while ago. I don't know if you're on a tour bus or what, but, um, you were in one of my favorite hip hop groups, uh, back in the day called styles of styles of beyond. And, uh, one of the rappers was named Ryu. And there's a video of you guys discussing each other's farts for about five minutes, which, uh, kind of <laughs> plays into the, um Mm -hmm. ass talk of fire poo Uh, and so that leads me to the early days of dj cheap shot and styles of beyond like i said one of my favorite groups i was i have probably all of your guys 12 inches that you put out i would buy every single one no matter what at amoeba rasputin or uh fat beats (laughs) beat nonstop, wherever i could find it i would get it um dopest some of the dopest beats winnetka exit you know all that stuff uh it was i'm from la too so big part of my upbringing um but yeah can you tell us like go back to the early cheap shot days i think i may have heard on another podcast that you called yourself baby c or something back oh. in the day um which well, now if you fast forward actually would be a very good name because everybody's named baby there's little baby to baby uh baby face a lot of babies <laughs> a lot of babies man no it's uh so baby it's so crazy c fits to- in. <laughs> it's so crazy to know that you like Styles of Beyond. Like while we were in Styles of Beyond, I felt like we we couldn't find a fan for the life of us. And oh, then man. and then even after, like even when then you're in Fort Minor and and like n- I didn't feel like anyone in America cared about Fort Minor. And then it's like years <laughs> later you start to get your flowers and you're like, "Fuck, that's so crazy that DJ Spider actually would buy those because you know a, a lot of the independent styles of beyond stuff i would physically take to the stores put on consignment hope that somebody would buy them 
you know, and, and to know that yeah. you were one of those guys that would go. Oh, in yeah. I was on the same cr- boat. I mean, I was in a group called Movement. It's I spelled M O M O V E period M E A N T. Same thing. I would. Bring, you know, I had a record label called Wax Paper Records, and we would press up the vinyl, and I would go store to store myself selling it. So I know the grind, and so also I was more prone to buy other people's stuff because I knew what they were going through, especially if it was dope. Um, but yeah, I mean that was that, that that was the game. So I, but your guys' stuff was genuinely dope. I didn't know you back then, so yeah. uh, the first thing that caught me was the beats. I mean, the beats were super dope. Somehow you guys, I don't know if you made songs with them or you were somehow connected or maybe in my head in the same way the Beat Nuts and the Alcoholics were like cousins, like uh, swollen members and Styles of Beyond share a place in my brain together. I don't know why. The beats and Probably the Probably because it's a, a white and black combo. You know, okay. and, 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 and I, I like our middle, the middle of our careers, uh, we were, we were trying to make rock rap better than the Limp Biscuit style of rock rap. We were trying to like rap over like Iggy Pop and the Stooges and, you know, like do cooler, like kind of move the rock rap thing a little bit forward. And Swollen yeah. Members was doing the same thing. And, right. um, I'll tell a fun story about them, but we would always get compared to them, I think because of the white black thing. Um, okay. and then even on like Napster back in the day, people would either call the styles of beyond songs, swollen members or swollen members songs, styles of beyond. And, you know, <laughs> right. Um, but they ended up, they were getting really popular in Canada and they were up for like a Canadian Grammy award. And I think their egos got really sort of, um, how do you say bigger than reality because they, they wanted to headline this massive tour in America and they asked us to open up for them. And we went on this tour and it was a dud. Like people weren't going out in the droves that I think they were expecting, but one right. they would always kind of stop the show and do this freestyle. And I remember we were in like, I think it was Colorado Springs and we were at Colorado Springs. And once styles of beyond's done performing, we usually just get the fuck out of there and go drink or something like that. But at this particular show, we were like sticking around. And I remember being out, outside with talk beer and uh, they stopped to do the freestyle and uh, Prevail, I think his name was. Prevail, he goes, um, you think your style's a beyond, but your style is gone. And we were like, oh shit, they're talking shit about us. Uh, and, and they brought us on, on tour to, to show that they're the dominant group out of us too. And I remember oh, like God. we were, and, and styles of beyond, we were full of negative energy and like, we were always thinking people were out to plot and scheme against us and stuff. And so I remember like <laughs> we were trying to think how we can get them back. And then, um, the tour was so bad. They just ended up canceling the tour after that. And we went home. <laughs> That's the end of the oh, story. No, no, um, no. But, <laughs> they were huge in Canada, right? I mean, yeah. it was, yeah, I was actually surprised when i found out how uh big they were in canada yeah. uh like they were dope i'm a fan of them but i was like wow this is nuts um, yeah and they, and they th- i think crazy. they thought it would it was translating into america and no disrespect to them i you know their music's yeah. great and uh but i just remember like they you could tell because we were also friends with mocha only and i think that was part of how we got the tour mocha was through only oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and mocha was on the tour and he kind of ease the whole he bridged the gap and then um but yeah when they got down here we just like saw how they were kind of swaggering and that swagger was kind of like getting less and less swaggery by the end of the tour wow so, that's interesting all. <laughs> okay well glad i brought that up <laughs> yeah yes yeah. sorry bad times bad times no no it's, it's all good um so that, I mean, yeah. So, so how did that come about? Like, how did you, where did your DJ journey start even before styles of beyond? How did cheap shot, uh, become baby C? How did, <laughs> how did all that come about? Where did you start DJing? Was your family into music? Um, how'd you get into hip hop? All those things. Yeah. The, so the history is, you know, my dad was actually in, uh, he, he played saxophone and he had gotten a demo deal with, uh, A&M records, but got shelved and kind of gave up music to raise his kids and, and do the adult thing. And, um, so, so there was all these jazz records in the house and, and it was important to my parents that we, me and my two older brothers would play instruments in the house. And so, um, they, you know, we, we did the piano thing and then I did saxophone and I played, you know, tequila after Pee Wee's Herman, Big Adventure came out and shit. Oh, and, of um, course. And, and then Great. after. Great and movie. Then, 
it's kind of a boring story and and uh but but either way like my brothers were buying me hip-hop cassettes in the 80s and uh it was my own thing right they didn't even like hip-hop they were just buying them for me and i right. I, I think I was jealous of my two older brothers because they were older and smarter and closer in age. And I was sort of like the outcast of the family and my dad loved music. So I think I wanted to do the, take the path of a musician, uh, to appease my father, you know, whatever the f dad shit we all, you know, get left with in our childhoods. Um, and so I was kind of <laughs> always on this, like, I love music. Somehow I'm going to be involved in music and hip hop became my own voice because it was the way I kind of like, ident like I, I had my own identity. And then, um, one weekend my parents left and I was, uh, 11 years old and my brothers threw a big open party while they were gone. And one of my brother's friends was a DJ. And I remember waking up like Sunday morning after the party and there's bodies uh, sleeping, passed over, alcohol everywhere. And the DJ equipment was still on. And I was fascinated. And I remember picked up the record, do what you like was on the platter, uh, rest in peace, shock G. And, uh, I press play and I got to do the whole, the thing that every DJ does when they, or any person does when they first like do the diff it, diff it, you know, and I was just like, that is, that right there is what I want to do. And I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to do it. And then as luck had it, that same DJ was selling his equipment, like literally like a week or two later. And my brother said, do you want to buy it? And I had been saving uh, leftover lunch money and, you know, odds and ends job money in this uh, Arrowhead water bottle. And I poured it out and I had 500 of the $550. The guy was asking for the coffin, the two techniques, 1200 and a new Mark 1650 mixer. And um, I put all my money into it and borrowed $50 from my parents. And then all, they all laughed at me because I was throwing away my life savings. And then it just grew and grew. And so that was 1989. And I just loved it. You know, I, it was it, I, like, it's all I did. Like, uh, you know, I kind of pissed on school, uh, but did enough to get by and just practiced and practiced. And then by the time I was in high school, um, I learned how to make beats without owning a sampler. Uh, you could cut this part out too, but I was basically like, like I was scratching ja my dad's jazz records over these Cameron Paul three minute long drum loops and then filling in the, the missing scratches on the third track. So it would create this like seamless, whatever. And then, um, and then so like, I like on a, on a four track, you would, yes. you would go through, put the drum break and then cut in the jazz samples. No, that's dope. Yeah, and, and and I still have the the cassette transfers. Uh, you know, I, I should share them with somebody at some point. But you could yeah. hear my parents in the background while Talk Beer from Styles of Beyond was rapping. But Talk Beer was godsend. <laughs> he was introduced to me in before my senior year in high school, and he came to my house and just rapped over these shitty four track beats. And I've never heard a rapper like him at the time. I'm like, he is amazing and and we started styles of beyond just he and i and um then i went to uc irvine and you know that's an hour away and you know back then it, it, it you know it's hard to keep in touch and so then yeah. he met ryu and i just i i really started letting school go because i'm like there's no way i'm losing being a part of this group because i just knew that like there was so much talent between him and ryu so i was like i'm gonna come hell or high water, I'm going to be a part of this group. And we just kind of kept it going. And, uh, that's how, I, 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 yeah, that's how style beyond started. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm glad you guys did it. Great music. And then from there, uh, like you said, you were in a group called Fort Minor with, uh, someone people may know Mike Shinoda, um, from Lincoln park. Um, how did that come about and what was that like? So Mike Shinoda and I, or the uh, styles of beyond Mike Shinoda, we, we had, fr uh, we were friends from before Lincoln park. He was a aspiring right. MC and one of the guys on styles of beyond's 2000 fold album, this guy named 007, um, who is now my partner in stupid fly, but, uh, that's the side of the point. He was from Agora. So was Mike Shinoda. They were making tracks and somehow Ryu and double O became friends. Shinoda started coming out and hanging out. Um, and while we got, we, you know, we got our first record deal in 98. Uh, with the Dust Brothers and Lincoln Park had signed their deal. And um, when we went on our first tour, 
we would hear Linkin Park being played on the radio. And, and I'm like, who's going to listen to this? Like Limp Bizkit was kind of on the way out already. And I'm like, this just kind of sounds like Limp Bizkit. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> like every city we were at, it was bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and we got dropped from our label and then we were sad. And then like, we were ready to like, we released an independent record in 2003. And I remember we had a, you know, back then you had a, you had to conference call, like four way call. And we four way called about quitting styles of beyond we're gonna break up like what are we gonna do in the the our lives after hip-hop you know that's what it felt like and then right. literally a week after that i was standing in front of amoeba records mike shinoda called me because i was also the manager of the group and he's like hey we just locked in our uh, label deal with warner brothers we're on tour right now but when we get back we're gonna sign styles of beyond to machine shop records and we we're like you know it was like it, it couldn't have been timed any better you know it just came right. at this time where we were at a literal low point in our lives um and he, they came and lived up to their promise signed us and the initial idea was that fort minor was going to be the launching platform for styles of beyond because we were signed to styles of beyond uh mike shinoda was gonna i think he wanted to uh, you know to kind of scratch that itch of doing real hip-hop and not just lincoln park style raps um yeah. but at the same time as a smart businessman, they wanted to use, they wanted to introduce Styles of Beyond to their fan base through this thing called Fort Minor. And, um, but really like it was that thing you dream about as a kid. Like I, you know, you probably felt it on Blink-182, but just like living the five-star hotel, like, you know, business class flights, like, like we, we finally got to live that, you know, biggie video style hip hop that we had always, that I think everyone gets into it for. Um, right. And, and albeit Fort Minor didn't get to the status we wanted it to be. And then uh, we got dropped by, well, they ended up closing the doors to their label. And we were kind of, you know, we had to start over uh, in 2009 um, in our 30s. But I look back on those years, just like I look back on Fire Poo, like, man, you know, I got, it was kind of like giving the lion a piece of the meat. Like I got to taste the meat. And I didn't get yeah. to bring it to be my own thing, like Styles of Beyond Dreams. But I got to feel what it is like to be a rock star. And it was super special. And I wouldn't trade it in for the world. It was, it was amazing. That is such a great story. And just one thing I want to go back to is you said you had a record deal with the Dust Brothers. <laughs> like, like, you mean um, the people that produce Paul's Boutique and stuff? Yeah. John, oh, wow. Mike and John. Yeah, we were signed to the Dust Brothers in night. Like they basically took 2000 Fold and they wanted they were fans and they wanted to release it. They had a label deal through Disney, which was called um, Mam Mammoth was the distribution company. Hollywood okay. Records was the label. And then they had like, s what do you call it? Tributary labels. And Dust Brothers had a label called Ideal Records. Um, and we had a record deal with that where they just re-released 2000 Fold. Um, uh, on a bigger scope and yeah we got to meet the dust brothers they did a, if uh, they did a remix to Winneka exit that you can find online the dust brothers remix of Winneka exit um, crazy and that was an amazing thing and and, and uh i love yeah, the what dust was it brothers. like so you didn't were you able to work with them or at least talk to them and have any kind of conversations and uh get insight into their thinking or i don't know much about them yeah, but so, I love you their know, music. I mean, Paul's Boutique is one of my favorite albums on the planet Earth. So. Same. Same as, same as you, man. You were cut from the same cloth. And I just remember being signed to them and being able to ask them about the beats that they made for Paul's Boutique. And, you know, they made that even before samplers. Like, when you really think about how beats were made back then, especially the Dust Brothers, who used, you know, 10 samples and 15 different drum breaks on every track they were splicing tape with razor blades i mean wow all those all those tracks you hear and that are amazingly mixed and seamlessly put together they were cutting with razor blades i mean it's it's insane like that's and, crazy it, it was similar and, to what you were doing with the four track and the break and and <laughs> scratching the jazz records in a way I mean, yeah, it may, it may, I mean, well, thank, I'm just like, saying in the, in the yeah. same way where you just have to make shit happen before the technology has been invented, but it's inside of your head and you want to just make it happen one way or another. It's very hip hop. 
It's very hip hop. And they were, you know, but they couldn't have been cooler, more gracious people. And their label was amazing. And I'm still friends with the, our publicist from that label and our marketing lady uh, from the label. And it was, it was a really ama amazing experience, but it was short lived because while we were on tour, we were just about to push 2000 fold on a real level um, uh, with a single easy back it up. Um, the, the label head, this guy named Jay Ferris, he was the head of Hollywood or head of mammoth, whatever it was. Uh, he got fired. And with that, all this, uh, the indie label and what do you call them? Tributary label. I don't know. Whatever. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Subsidiary. It doesn't matter. They, uh, he got fired and every, and so it got the, our label folded too. And it was uh, just like, damn, right in the middle of the 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 work right oh that's crazy and then from there uh something else that's very hip-hop was you were able to dj some things for new kids on the block right or is that <laughs> not <laughs> no dude i'm uh, with you <laughs> no I'm it just was kidding. not hip-hop at you, all you you like it's such a funny juxtaposition from all the <laughs> stuff we're talking about but and actually probably in between there um you got very into the club scene and we're doing a lot of the clubs and bottle service things and touring and, and doing a lot of the stuff that, that I was doing and evil one and all the same people you were discussing earlier were doing, what was your kind of transition to go from that and the tour days of Fort minor to then trying to be a touring traveling DJ play clubs, go to Vegas and do things like that. Um, and then eventually Maybe you can speak on the new kids on the block thing if you want to talk yeah. about it. Uh, wh what oh, I was love that, that journey like? Yeah, man. So, um, th so I I have some funny stories. Uh, you know, it depends how Please. deep you want to go. But, no, I want but, all the stories. Uh, you know, don't feel self conscious. Just tell them. I, I love to hear it. Okay, so like you, I was a part of this mashup thing that was happening, un just naturally in the world, right? Like I think yeah. a lot of us give. AM the credit that he deserves because he was definitely the the forefront pioneer of sort of this mashup craze at the time in the early 2000s. But from my right. college days, I was playing fraternity or sorority parties, and the, the the name of the game was keeping these drunken maniacs on the dance floor that came from all creeds and cultures. And so it was, you know, it was this game of like, how do I make Duran Duran go into you know whatever hip hop, you know. The, Fucking yeah, Mark Morrison, you know, like whatever was hot at the time. And so I think through that, I had to cre do these mashup things too. And, um, but I never knew that there were scenes, I guess. I was just so caught up in my own world that I just assumed everything was the same, if that makes sense. And like, you just had to be good at rocking a party to be good at rocking every party. And right. um, so after college, I'm, I've been friends with Vice forever. Like he was, uh, we met in college and DJ Vice was in the same crew as me called Mackay. And he, you know, he can, he can literally rock any crowd. You put him in the middle of the Sahara, he's going to figure out something to rock the fucking camels, you yeah. know? Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. so, so after college, all I had was sorority, fraternity parties, no real clubs under my belt. And he called me and he said, hey man, um, there's this club called AD. Uh, where, you know, it's a Hollywood scene and you need, I, I, I can't, AM is the guy in charge and he can't make it. I'm usually the backup and I can't make it. So this is the first time that's happened. And we want you to cover me for this night. And I'm like, no problem. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. You got to come over and I'm going to tell you what to play and when to play and uh kind of give you you know school you on this because it's the hollywood scene i'm like okay guy so i went over to his house <laughs> and he's saying like play color me bad at this time and play this song at this time and you're gonna want to squeeze in some rock and da 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 and the whole time i'm doing the jacking off hands like okay yeah sure thing whatever <laughs> and then the last thing he says is and whatever you do don't drink and i'm like definitely not listening to that part. Like I didn't tell him that, but I'm like, Oh, that is not happening because in my, from these fraternity sorority parties, I, I thought drinking was part of my whole thing. So 
Then me and my best friend, Jester, who is also part of Vice's crew, I just invited Jester just because I didn't want to go alone. And I said yeah, he could course. DJ with me. And then he brings his girlfriend. I bring my best friend. And we go and drink a fifth of gin straight out of the bottle before we even get to the gig. Oh, God. And <laughs> and I'm thinking like this is just going to be a sorority party and then we get there um, and go up into the booth and there is just room for one DJ and a lighting person who is there um, and we start DJing and we're drunk as fuck and we both have endless gin and ton we're just going to town like stretched out the headphones all the way to the bar to get drinks and we're just not stopping to drink. We're going one for one. Like Jester would walk in the booth and play a record. And then I would, you know, sneak behind him and then get on the left side. Whatever. We're breaking right. all the fucking rules Vice told us to. Midway through, I'm like, nobody's on the... That's weird. Nobody... This must be an off night because no one's on the dance floor. And then we see Jessica Simpson and Nick Lachey and Justin Timberlake sitting down to our right. And I'm like, that's so weird. Like, no one's into this and then blackout drunk the night ends is so weird and then this mean lady comes up to me and throws 250 dollars whatever she paid me cash at my chest and says never come back here again and then uh i don't i still don't understand what's going on vice is in new york and so it's like 5 a.m where he's at he calls me and he goes what the fuck just happened and I'm like, uh, we DJ'd your club. And what happened was we were so bad and so belligerent, they had to escort everybody to the outside patio where the, like, the shitty DJ goes. And everyone was crammed in the back because nobody wanted to be in my shitty fraternity party of a nightclub that night. And I was literally blackballed from Hollywood from 2001, I think that was, until 2003 and i remember re-meeting am and him going oh you're that guy you're the guy <laughs> who sucks who you're the wow. guy who ruins nightclubs and that's my uh that was my introduction crash course into the hollywood scene unbelievable had you ever been to ad or any of the clubs no. to see them before i'm not a club guy i like white <laughs> like i like <laughs> shitty dive bars where you could talk you could have a conversation with somebody and and i like djing but I don't like hanging out at nightclubs. That was never my thing. Oh, my God. That's nuts. I'm with you, though. I never went to a nightclub really until probably same AM Vice kind of days. I remember meeting them and they're like, come through this spot. And I'm, I'm at LAX and Element and watching both of them do their things <clears throat> and really learning like, oh, wow, this is a whole different world you know i'd go to the root down or like underground hip-hop kind of nights or, or reggae you know <laughs> things but yeah a whole different whole different thing so i understand that's hilarious though wow i'm glad that you got back in so that was a vinyl days too <laughs> vinyl <laughs> exactly it was all kevin scott's you know i remember playing all the what was his breaks called like uh, the classic lethal weapons? party rockers uh yeah, lethal weapon yeah, like, I think Lethal Weapon was my jam, like the eight bar hip hop, like 50 cent eight bar intro and stuff. Oh, yeah. I have um, all those. Yep. Yeah. And, and, but it was just like, it was the most embarrassing night uh, of like one of the most embarrassing nights of my life. And then, but the redemption story is a couple years later, right next to LAX before it was LAX when it was Lost Palmas, there was this place called Deluxe. And I was somehow lucky enough to DJ that night and it became its own little ecosystem of Hollywood that, and nobody knew I was the guy who ruined AM's club. And then, um, the, <laughs> the lady who fired me from bolt house, this girl named Jen, who you probably know, she ended up yeah. coming to deluxe and I saw her dancing. And then she called me a couple days later and was like, whatever you did that night, I want you to come do Joseph's and do the same thing there. And I'm like, Oh, you know, so I kind of felt like I had this redemption. Uh, yeah. Did sorts. she know you were the same guy? Yeah, good question. I was too, you know, she's a very, how do you say? Like I, I, she, you don't, it's just hard talk to read. To <laughs> yeah. 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 You're not just so going to ask. She doesn't have time for your questions, I guess. Uh, that, type 100%. Of, that, that kind of vibe. Yeah, so I didn't want to ask, like, do you remember me from ruining that night? So I just, uh, I just took the gig and I said, let's go. And uh, that was it.
Amazing. And then you became a, you know, somewhat of a staple in the scene. Like you said, you know, all these people, you've got the ability, you've got the experience and you started traveling a lot and doing a lot of gigs in Hollywood and, and all over the place and becoming your own touring DJ, um, which then led into different things um, like the new kids on the block thing. So what... What was that all about? So, so after like the, my Hollywood thing kind of ran its course around 2004, probably like when you were, you were j probably just like really starting to get traction and blow up in the Hollywood scene. I would imagine around that time. Yeah. It, like 2005, 2006 for me probably was when I was just getting let in, you know, able to open for people and stuff in Hollywood. Yeah, and my 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 it felt like my candle was sort of burning out because I had done deluxe from 2002 to 2004, and again with the whole networking thing, I didn't have anywhere to go after that club. Like I did a few others, but it just kind of dimmed out pretty fast. And then, um, so but anyhow, but then luckily around 2006, DJ Cobra had started this thing called Captains of Industry with Stone Rock and Graham Funky and Marshall Barnes. And, and he basically said, hey, you want a manager? And I'm like, hell yeah. Because I remember hearing like people were starting to travel and make money and it sounded like a lot of fun and it sounded yeah. like good money. And so through that, I joined Captains of Industry and then Graham and Stone ended up going to Scam. And Vice, again, he stuck his neck out for me and brought me over to Scam. And... um. You know, I was just coming off of Fort Minor and I've always been a hip hop guy. So I pride myself as a hip hop guy and being bred as a straight male in the San Fernando Valley. I was born and bred to hate new kids on the block because all the girls like them in the in elementary school. So then Sujit, the owner of Scam, calls me one day. He's like, hey, uh, you're going to you're going to. Uh, you're going to take a meeting with Donnie Wahlberg to be a uh, new kids on the block DJ. And I'm like over my dead fucking body. Like, I don't want to be like, I'm hip hop, man. I don't want to do new kids on the block. He's like, you're doing it. And then he hangs up the phone and I'm like, Oh shit, I guess I'll do it. And, uh, that, um, I, I, in my head, I'm like, I'm just going to go tell a story of me meeting Donnie Wahlberg because that will be funny, but I'll never get this gig. And I wore yeah. a baby blue button up shirt that day. I ate a chili dog and some of the chili went on my shirt. And no. uh, I remember being like, N I'm not getting this for sure. Like who gives a shit? And I go down there, meet Donnie. He was super nice, but also super clear that he was interviewing all these other DJs. And he even mentioned DJ premier in there. And I'm like, well, if he has the premier connection, what? like what am I even doing here? Um, yeah. but, but I took the meeting and he was super nice. I, I got to admit, I was like blown away about how charismatic and, and warm he was. And then I walked away just thinking I'd never hear about it again. And then like a week later, Sujit goes, you're going on tour in a week with new kids on the block. And I literally like, I, I, this is embarrassing to say, uh, in public, but like I was close to tears. I was like, I, this is bad for my brand. Cause I, I was so quote unquote hip hop. Uh, this is going to hurt me in the long run. Um, but also I respected Sujit and I knew he was creating opportunity. So I called my dad and I was like, ah, oh, this is bad. And he's like, it doesn't sound bad to me. And then, <laughs> and, but I was still sad. But then all of a sudden, Graham Funky, who I really respect, he called me and he's like, dude, congratulations. I wanted that gig so bad. You were made for this. And I'm like, you wanted this? He's like, oh my God, I would have loved to be their DJ. And so all of a sudden, so I felt a little bit better about it, but I yeah. still never thought people still cared about new kids on the block. Like to me, this was just going to be some, you know, uh, how do you say like watching the beach boys play a small room in Vegas in the eighties, you know, like it just felt, felt sad. Like that's what I, I pictured playing like retirement homes and you know, for a room of four people. Um, right. But so we get to Vegas and we played the palms for two nights and we, you know, the curtains are closed and, uh, the, and, and I'm like, well, this is going to be sad and embarrassing. And then it opens and it's like sold out crowd. And I've like, even in like playing with Lincoln park and being in Fort minor overseas where people cared, I never saw fans cry. And when the, the, these curtains open for new kids on the block, the just women, it was all women and tears everywhere. They're crying and fainting and going, I've never heard a piercing sound that I heard from all these screams that these guys had. And so that just set the tone for this entire tour. And what was so dope is like DJs were such a part of music culture at that time. We were like blowing up that yeah. 
they, they had the most talented band play live on stage, but they all had to wear black and they never caught any of the spotlight. But meanwhile, I'm on my own riser. I have a spotlight directly on me and the, everyone would leave the stage while the guys would go change for their acoustic, like love, love set, love song set. And yes, I would yes. hit the air horn and I would say D -d -d DJ cheap shot. And I would have the stage for, I think it's a five minute set of just like mashing shit up that their fans would like. And, uh, but it was like, oh my, it was crazy. It was crazy. That's unbelievable. It's so cool to hear. And then you ended up, how long did you do that for? So that was, so I did the whole, it was like a whole summer of 2010. Um, mm -hmm. So it was probably like a, a month. And, and here's what was cool about it. You'll appreciate this. It was like, I was getting older. I was trying to start a business at home, but this tour, because I think they were older also, that we just flew into a city and did two shows Friday and Saturday, sometimes a daytime on Saturday, and then fly home on Sunday. So it was just like amazing. And then Sujit would get me gigs in whatever city I was in to go yeah. DJ after the concert. And it was just this like better than you know, traveling on a Thursday to Portland, uh, Friday to M Milwaukee and, you know, whatever uh, yeah. the, the normal DJ routine was. It was this amazing, like, just fly in one city, maximize income, fly home and then go to work on Monday, you know? Best um, possible scenario. <laughs> yeah. And then um, they have a cruise, like New Kids on the Block has their own fucking cruise. And so I, I DJed for that for them in 2011 also. And then... Um, came back i think it was 2012 or 2013 it was boys to men 98 degrees and new kids on the block on an arena tour and uh they wanted me to dj in these arenas but it was the worst tour ever for a dj it was nothing like the tour i did in 2010 and it was actually that tour that really opened my eyes to like okay i got to i got to get out of this this is no longer what I wanted it to be as the 11 year old aspirational kid. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I respect your self, um, I guess, realism or knowledge or, or be able to self reflection. You know, you, I feel like you're very uh, real with yourself and then you tend to make decisions and stick with them from what I've learned from all of your stories. And, <laughs> Um, I respect that. It's hard to do, you know, especially being your own boss and trying to figure your way out. And, and you're also open to try things, which I think is how anybody gets better at anything and learns anything. And so, like you said, you were trying to start this business at home, which I assume was your TV and film uh, music composition business, creating music for that and sort of getting out of the traveling DJing thing. So how did you make that this full decision to do that? How did that come about? And um, yeah, what have you learned from, from all of that? Because now over the past, what, at least 10 years, you've created a company called The Math Club, which is now your life um, before the whole stupid fly and fresh era thing that you're doing right now. Um, how did that come about? How did you make that decision? And what went into all of that? So I've, I, you know, I, instinctually when I, even when I was 11 and I got the turntables, I had this weird premonition of the old DJ, like the old DJ with pony. I pictured him with ponytails <laughs> and earrings. And at the time it was 40. Like I was like DJing, that seems bad, whatever that was. So I always had this clock on my mind of like, I don't want to be some, I don't want to be old enough to be someone's father. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a young man's game or whatever. And so, um, so I always had this clock going. And then I, like I mentioned before, with Styles of Beyond, I had my own independent record label to release my friend's records. It was not very professional, but I, it was just a place to make records uh, for my friends. And, but while I was there, I would feel these emails of people that wanted to license Styles of Beyond or Lexicon or Four Zone, you know, what uh, Allo Black was part of our label. Um, and, and it, it, it was this amazing thing where, 
you didn't have to do any additional work. You were just signing these deals for people to use your record in film and television projects. And right. I sort of, over time, I met a couple supervisors and would, I made a couple sample free beats for a music library and started to see this like beautiful performance royalty income from these syncs on film and television. But once we signed our record deal with Linkin Park, I didn't own my music anymore. Like that was owned by other people and we had no say on all these other, these important things. And I had to cut off those contacts. And so when we had that fateful meeting and realization that the Lincoln Park label was closing, um, we were now in our thirties and it's like, well, what are we going to do? And I had an opportunity to score a pilot for A&E and I'm like, well, that, that, that is what I want to do moving forward. I don't want to go back doing underground hip hop shows. I don't want to go push pencils at some regular job. I want to make music for film. Like there was something special about music for film and television where it felt more like a, a math problem. Like it's, you're giving me a scene and I need to create something that can evoke the emotion you're trying to get across. Right. And, um, so so I basically just did it. Like you said, like I just, I thought of this idea, just like I thought of fire poo and I committed to it. And I felt that I was like, at the time I was watching like discovery channel. <laughs> I think it was like deadliest catch and some other, you know, um, intervention. Those are my shows. And, uh, yes, I remember, yes. oh my God, I used to watch <laughs> intervention all the time. I don't know why, like I'd be oh, so into why. it. <laughs> I know why it makes you feel better about yourself. Like I remember like I was smoking true. and drinking back then and I'm like, yeah. well, I'm not that bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. Very um, true. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and, but I would hear these hip hop, these so-called hip hop beats on there and I'm like, those suck. And I think yep. I can bring a major label quality hip hop sound to film and television. And it seemed like something needed. And that was sort of what launched me, you know, into that, like, okay, now I'm going to do that. Uh, DJing, I love it because, and it was paying, you know, crazy money around 2000, what, like 2005 to 2010 to, or 2014, really when I quit, but it was hard to give up. Uh, but so, yeah, so I just kind of like, but I, but I said, this is going to be the marathon of my life. And I really got to set up and I got to, you know, build this business and do it the right way. All these things I failed at prior I'm going to use to my advantage and not replicate those mistakes while I'm building this business. Right. Um, and, and, and then we just kind of like set off on this mission to create better hip hop than what everyone else was serving up in this side of the game. And, um, and yeah, and so that's how it was born. Um, and then it evolved into something else, uh, as it went on, but it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny industry because you're now no longer making music for yourself. So you, there's a lot of letting go, right? Like with yeah. Styles of Beyond, you could sit there and nurture it and, you know, tool it for days and weeks and months until you have the perfect 10 song album. Whereas in film and television, sometimes you have four hours to create a full song and it may be replacing, you know, an artist you don't necessarily like or a style of music you don't necessarily know how to create. And you just go and you do it because. It's not your art. So you're forcing this art that is half-assed sometimes to be judged by people that, you know, like it shouldn't be judging it or it's not ready to be judged yet. You know what I mean? So it's a really yes. weird industry to be in. Um, right. But yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a, you know, it's kind of, it's not, it's not a hate, but it's like, a, it's a blessing and a curse. Like sometimes it's like, man, I wish I was just making music that I, I loved um, versus just being able to make music doing what I love, I guess. So it's yeah. got a little bit of both sides. Yes. It has the same balance as DJing in clubs and stuff, I think too, where, or weddings or things like that, where you, you're there to solve a problem. You're there to make people happy and make things good. Um, but if you were to just fully do exactly what you wanted to do, then it would just be for you. You have to do it for them. And especially for film and TV, like you said, it, a lot of cooks in the kitchen and different ideas towards it. So, but it seems like 
you know, it's been pretty successful. You've done some amazing things and amazing shows and movies and um, all types of stuff. I mean, just going through this probably old, but looking, I feel like you've done so much more since this, but Lego, Batman movie, Shazam, Spider-Man, Far From Home, Big Mouth, Always Be My Maybe, Avengers, Age of Ultron, Ant-Man, Euphoria. I know you did Crazy Rich Asians, bunch of stuff. So, I mean, sounds like it's been a, a successful thing for you. Um, and now you're headed into... The, the fresh era, the stupid fly era. And you're still, it's not like you're leaving that behind. You're still doing that. That's still your business and thing that you're working on. And you've got a crew of people that you work on all of it with. Um, this is just another venture that you can bring into the fold of all of your projects, right? Exactly. It's, it, you know, stupid fly was really built with the intention of just like preserving the legacy of these guys that I just yeah. cherish in my life. And, and I feel like are all but forgotten in a lot of, in, in at least the, the eyes of the younger generations, you know, like it's a billion dollar industry and these guys laid the bricks and nobody's really giving them the flowers. And I know m most of them could use, you know, they, they could, they still need purpose out there. They're not, you know, LL Cool J and just ready to retire. You know what I mean? Like they still got to hustle and grind. And so I want to help them for all the help they've given me and all the inspiration they've given me. I want to, Give, this is my way of giving back to them and turning the spotlight back on them. I love that. I think that's much needed. And especially with the quality and passion that you guys are putting into it is great. It's not just someone going, what do you think? Is uh, Biggie, is Nas better than Jay-Z? I don't know. You know, it's like not just one of those kind of things. So I, I love to see it and hear it. Oh, thanks. Um, oh, thank you, man. It means so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, oh my God, so many great stories and uh, learned, I've learned more about you than I even knew. And like you said, this has been so much fun for me as a DJ because it's people that I've known for 15 years that I've had to just talk to in clubs. Like you said, being like, I've heard this song. Great. Like you don't have a, a real conversation. So I really get to know everybody. Some DJs, I don't even know their real name and I've known them for 15 years, you know, so you really get, <laughs> I get to know the story and really who these people are and, and I love it. So getting to know you better has been fun. And our audience also sent in some questions for you to answer, uh, if you're willing to go through some of those. Yeah, definitely, man. I okay. hope I'm not being too long winded. Like you, you know, feel free. You're to not too long winded at all. Okay. No, I want. I mean, you know, I wrote when I was trying to come up with things to talk to you about. The top thing I wrote was stories. We need because you've got so many good stories and you're so good at telling them. So I feel like we didn't get in even into enough. But I want to hit the the listener questions and not keep you all day. Um, and then, but no, I love it. I mean, you you're great at telling stories, and um, I think people will get a lot out of this. And I enjoy talking to you endlessly. So definitely not too long winded. Um, let's see. So we got, and a lot of the people that commented are a lot of our old school fam and friends here. So we got nice. Joe Diggs. You remember Joe Diggs? Yeah. Uh, Sa Arizona, Santa, right? Santa Barbara. Oh, and Santa then Arizona. Barbara. Don't, don't cut that well, part. I, okay. I met so him in Santa Barbara <laughs> probably like a thousand years ago. And he would play, I used, I did a mixtape with Graham Funky called Rocket Science. Uh, yes, that was all the best. rock. That was legendary, by the way. Oh, I would God. play that all the time. Thank you. So he, I think, would play it in the Santa Barbara bar when we weren't there all the time and then would book us to come DJ. And then he went to Arizona and now he's doing so many cool things and family guy. But he asks something we sort of answered, but uh, fire poo coming back or nah? <laughs> so, so we know, we know, Joe, love you, man. You know, he actually hosted um, Santa Barbara poo. We did a fire poo in Santa Barbara ah. with him and... Uh, Matt Zizix, Matt, uh, yes, Maddie, 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 boom, boom. I can't remember his DJ name, but Matt, uh, um, Maddie, Maddie, something, right? I, I remember he would play at that place right next to Vice's shoe store crossover. Yeah. And I think he and, worked at the shoe store for a period of time. Yeah. Um, and then we, it was like that outside place to, I can't remember, but I, I DJed there a few times. It was pretty fun. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, but, uh, and we had a fire poo there in Santa Barbara and it was super dope. But Joe, uh, fire poo comes back when, when the community needs it back. That's where yeah. we'll leave it. Well, it's after the pandemic is when we need it back, I think. Uh, we got to all <laughs> see each other in person once we're all 
safely together and can eat wings. Uh, there was a moment in the pandemic where I was like, should I, st- should I was thinking like, I could do fire poo as a stream where every, like have everyone yeah. go order from home and like, just kind of like, it was a half baked idea, but I was like, that could be kind of fun. And I just never pulled the trigger. Well, still possible. Not a bad idea. I mean, we're doing this virtually. Everybody's used to it now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I used to be like, we're doing a podcast and be like, where do I meet you? Now it's just like, <laughs> okay, send me the link, which yeah, is exactly. fine. Uh, I'm, I'm cool with it. I like both sides of it. Um, Let's see. DJ Perform, a uh, big supporter of the show, asks, will your remixes be on BeatSource? Oh, if if you guys want them, I have the high quality waves. I just don't like I made those things in 2000 shit, 11 to 2012. I was making these remixes and some people liked them. Uh, they were on a SoundCloud. Uh, fun story. I was putting these things out just to like because I was making the beats anyhow, and then I would just throw these old yeah. school hip hop uh, acapellas on top of these beats I was making for my company. Um, I posted one, and it went number one on Hype Machine, and I couldn't believe it. Which and it one got, was like, it? It was Notorious B.I.G. Um, uh, Party and Bullshit. Okay. So I and so that has like two hundred fifty thousand. I think maybe more now uh, on my SoundCloud, and I couldn't believe it was crazy. Um, crazy. But yeah, if uh, if if anyone wants them, um, you could. Get them I'm sure if they could legally uh, put them up, uh, we got to talk to Kid <laughs> Spin, the music director. Beat Source is official, legal now, yeah. so uh, then it's not going to happen. I've skated on uh, legal issues with those things forever, so. But maybe uh, Styles will be on and Fort Minor are on there. Who knows? Uh, yeah, we, gotta, well, we, gotta, we can make that happen for sure. We can make that happen check. for sure. Um, let's see. DJ Sean Perry, uh, another amazingly oh. hilarious human who I've slept on his couch in New York and had funny conversations with and was one of the final people to hang out with uh, right before the pandemic kicked off. I remember being at a scratch session with him at a headliner music club where we met Jadakiss and everyone was trying to scratch after and we were wiping everything down with Clorox and Eric Deluxe and DJ five. And we were like, should we be doing this? And then I went to some crazy club called kiss, kiss, bang, bang uh, in Koreatown. And we were like, are we going to get COVID? What are we doing right now? And I think that was the last night I've been out. (laughs) Oh my God. That's so nuts. Yeah, so he says, uh, where the fuck did you go, you big old dill? Fire poopy is missed. Okay, so that's <laughs> <laughs> just uh, putting Man, it out Sean there. Sean Perry, shout out to Sean Perry. He is hilarious. Like, we, we spent some crazy times in New York together. I love that guy. Yeah, me too. Um, all right, Matt Mira, uh, another uh, legendary old school friend, asks, yes. uh, can you ask Cheap Shot if he's ever going to respond to my email from 11-8-2019? Thanks. <laughs> so I don't know. You got some emails out there. <laughs> uh, Matt, I did not forget about you. I could answer here, but I think it'd be super embarrassing. Uh, but I will <laughs> respond to it. I love Matt also. he Doesn't he like manage Cascade now? I think he's the tour manager for Cascade. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I, I yeah. know he he's also a proud father, a great human, and doing great things. And I am in a group chat with him and various other people where we discuss trading digital cards. <laughs> Very nerdy awesome. uh, thing. But uh, yeah, kind of like this NFT thing, but for digital trading cards and for this thing called NBA Top Shot. So we, uh, this company takes our money and we collect these digital trading cards and you can buy and sell them and make money. I mean, the amount of like return on investment I've got is actually pretty damn good. I was doing it just for my son. I have an eight year old son that loves sports. So I'm like, Hey, look at this fun thing we can do together. And all of a sudden it becomes this huge uh, movement because of the NFT movement and music and people selling artwork for millions of dollars. And now this company's making hundreds of millions of dollars, NBA top shot. So uh, we're in a group chat constantly talking about, uh, what did you get? I got LeBron James. I got Anthony Davis, you know, type of thing. How much are the cards? Well, it's a lot goes into it. So the cards, you, there's a marketplace to buy them used after you, the people have bought them new, but you wait in these digital lines to buy packs. So sometimes you wait in a digital line, there'll be 60,000 packs. If you get like number 100 and 
20,000, you're not going to get it. If you get number 52,000 in the digital line, you'll get the pack. Sometimes they're $9. Uh, the other day, I bought one for $149, which I was like, am I getting ripped off? What's happening to me? <laughs> so... And some of the cards ended up only being worth three dollars. One of them was worth about one hundred and forty bucks, so I'll take it. Uh, but it's interesting. It's speculative. Uh, we'll see yeah. where all of this goes. I bought these, the first edition tops um, digital trading baseball cards because the nba top shot are these digital moments so you can watch lebron james dunk it and some of those can be up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. people are paying Damn. for it which is mind-blowing to me i think there's all these cryptocurrency people in the space so they've got like money that's almost like feels like play money and they're like paying like in ethereum and all this stuff so yeah. they're able to buy mi a million dollars worth of cards like it's nothing um uh, and is, then i you bought know it's crazy. I bought these tops cards and I paid $105. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? And I checked <laughs> yesterday and it was like worth a thousand something dollars, just my little collection. So that's uh, dope. And that makes sense. Knows? Like I was, I was having a hard time sort of understanding NFTs, but that sounds at least like a fun, enjoyable experience aside from it ever accruing value. At least you're getting some yeah. entertainment value out of it. That's cool. Yeah, my I, it's a bonding thing with my son and I. He loves it. They put music. Honestly, somebody does the library music or the composing for these these things. So it's like yeah. some beat. Now we listen to it and we're like having fun. And they put new beats on the new moments. And he noticed and we're having fun listening to it. So, And who knows? This could be like how Pokemon cards in the future are worth you know, $200,000 for a Charizard, or it could be something <laughs> that flops into nothing, but it's not like I'm paying that much money for it, but I could yeah. see it turning into something. I mean, it, in the same way where NFTs are hard to understand and people are saying, Oh, but I downloaded it. Here we go. I saved the JPEG. Like this shows in the same way where you collect baseball cards or you collect things where the NFT plays into it and the digital ownership and chain of ownership can mean something over time, you know? Yeah. Or if you potentially bought one of these that Steph Curry owned himself and you can prove that through the blockchain and all of this stuff. So, of course, just like any industry, the beginnings of it, a lot of ridiculous things are happening at this point, but there are hints uh, towards what could happen in a realistic future. And a lot of people are making money now, uh, but it, I think it will lead towards other creative ways for people to utilize this stuff. And uh, an NFT could be a way for people to have ownership in the music if it gets licensed to a movie and they get a piece yeah. of it or um, things like that, or get front row seats to the new kids on the block tour because you bought the <laughs> nft you know or who Dude, that's, knows that's dope that's a really I, I like hearing about that stuff that's cool yeah so there's there's ways to do it i even have this idea for these uh thing called nf tapes that are like these mixtapes and these digital trading cards of beats and having producers in it and be able to trade them and do other things on top of them and uh you know th there's a lot of crazy stuff there i helped promote this choir in dallas wrote me and asked me to help them promote this thing and they did it through async art and it's this way where they can make five different layers of music on the nft and whoever did each layer can get paid in a certain way and also the owner of the nft can it can come out in its own specific way by the way each layer of music is unlocked. It was so interesting. And they asked me to help them promote it. And it was so interesting to me. The artist was great. And the composer and the person uh, or the conductor of the group. And then I saw yesterday they sold one of them or part of it for $375,000. I was like, oh my God. What? You know, I wrote them congratulations. And in a way that helped change the the perception of classical music and choirs and Wow. It, we're really at the forefront of a lot of creative things able to be done and a lot of scams and fake things are going to come out of it as well. But yeah. I think the creative people that are going to take the reins and do things with it, it's going to be very interesting and a lot of cool things will happen in the future. I hope. Yeah, that sounds super dope. And just like owning it this early on, I like like you said, the first series of tops things, that's got to be worth something in 10 years, right? Like if I it continues to trend. Yeah. yeah, or who knows, this whole blockchain that they have it on dissolves into nothing and I paid $105. But I exactly. also paid $105 for like 
food the other night so you know it's the same <laughs> same uh it's it's whatever you value um all right let's move on one of your great friends um from the past has sent a shitload of questions so i guess we can go through them pretty quickly but and he's also a legendary dj dj vice one of the oh. one of the greats one of the best humans one of the best djs um very inspirational person says when did you stop drinking and start running like forrest gump good question dj vice good question <laughs> dj vice um uh so so two th- february 2nd 2011 i finally i looked at myself and i said holy crap i couldn't even remember the last time i had not drank at a dj gig it scared me um yeah. and uh i was like i just want to try to do this next weekend sober just to see if I could do it, what that would be like. And I had a gig in Portland on Friday and Milwaukee on Saturday. And I just, all I remember was like, I was just as shitty as a DJ. Uh, but, but I didn't feel like shit in the next, in the next morning when I was going to the airport. <laughs> I was like, wow, not much changed except I feel better. And then, uh, yeah. and then it just kind of like dominoed into, a. Wow, I, I wonder if I could do that for six months. And then I did six months. And then I was like, why would I go back now that I work so hard to get here? So uh, I just kind of kept it going. I miss it every day. Um, but that was sort of like what thrust me into motion with the, the stopping the drinking thing. Um, right. And then and, but the and running you've thing, been sober. Sorry to interrupt. You've been sober ever since then, 2011. Yes. So, so yeah, oh. it's been uh, 10 years now. And um, congrats. I, That's huge. Th- and then, so what was funny though, is in that first weekend, I remember the promoters and other DJs were making fun of me. It was almost like this culture yeah. of like, you had to be drunk in the club. And I never knew that right. existed because I was just always drunk. And then, um, <laughs> and so I was like, well, I need a good excuse. And I was trying to think of an excuse for the next time I would go out. So it just seemed like I had to be sober. But then DJ Jester, my, my best friend, he out of fucking nowhere, he goes, Hey man, you want to run a, a half marathon? And I hate running. I've never <laughs> ran. I still hate it to this day. But I realized that if I said I'm training, that sounds kind of like a cool way to tell a promoter that I'm not drinking. And right. so, true. And so, yeah. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. And then, uh, and then, much like everything else in my life, I just never quit. And so I just, um, it just evolved into like, oh, I could do six miles. Oh, I could do nine miles. Oh, I'm ready to do a half. And then, you know, in 2017, I think I ran the, or maybe 18, I did the LA marathon. I did the full thing without stopping. Wow. And, and so oh I just kind of, beca- and, and now I just do it because I have this whole, like, if I don't run, I'm going to turn fat, f- false f- thing in my head. And so I just <laughs> continue to run, even though I'm still tortured every time I run. I still so hate you it. run every day like vice no 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 no. i run 20 miles a week in whatever capacity that is so Damn. i try to find that's um, impressive oh thanks man and so and so that's it so and to answer vice 2010 uh or 2011 is when i found sobriety and fucking running wow and do you run around your neighborhood where do you run that far so I hate running in circles. So I need a destination. <laughs> so I now run from my home in La Crescenta to my office in Hollywood, which is a 10 mile run. Uh, what? From you <laughs> on, on Mondays and Fridays is my new schedule. So I run and you, Monday. And you run to work? Yeah, I run to work. Stinky, sweaty, because in the <laughs> pandemic, no one's here to smell me. And so I smell, I reek, I, I, I'm disgusting, but I carry a backpack with a change of clothes. And so I, I change when I get here, but I still smell. Oh my God. You, so I'm going to look out for you on my drives from La Crescenta <laughs> to Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you ever see a, a tall, goofy, like I run like a doofus too. Like I'm, you, you wear the full, the flash costume and just run. <laughs> I wear, dude, I just have no, like I run duck footed, you know, I do the whole duck, but I like, I run so early. I'm like, who cares? Who's going to make fun of me? You know, I'm what too time? old to care. I leave at 6.15 from my house to get oh here. My God. I, get, I get to the Starbucks at like close to 8 a.m. And then I have a coffee. I'm oh, so you're making old. me feel so lazy at this point. Jesus Christ. No, it's, it's, it's pure. Like I look at my life and I'm like, dude, I am such the old, g-. like I wear Saucony sh- running shoes and like, you know what I mean? Like I have no style. I just wear things that are functional. I, 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 I like drinking coffee is a highlight of my day. It's pathetic. And then you run home at the end. No. And then I walk home. 
You walk home. That's still a lot. No. You walk 10 miles back to your house. No Uber or anything. It's actually 11 because the run, I run to the Starbucks. That's a mile from my office. And then I walk from my office. So that's 11. Um, and it's torture and it's all uphill to La Crescenta from here. So I kind of run all downhill and then I walk all uphill and it's yeah, a isn't nightmare. it like all freeways. How do you even get there? That's crazy. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, I take uh, so I take Las Feliz to Glendale to, and then Glendale just turns into Verdugo, turns into La Crescenta turns. And then I turn on whatever. That's all. So it's way up there. Holy shit. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's the most surprising thing of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man. So, so thank you, DJ Vice. I miss you and love you. Oh my God. That's amazing. All right. Thank you, DJ Vice. Blood out. I'll give you a blood <laughs> out. Um, all right. DJ Vice also sent in about 7,000 other questions. Uh, we'll blow through them. Let's see. He said, who was your best and worst interview on college radio at KUCI, which is Irvine's college radio station? fuck that's so man that's taking me back best interview hands down was exhibit exhibit like nobody wanted to make the drive to irvine we were like the the stepchild of la everyone on their la college tour runs would never come see us because they're like if i'm in la may as well just do all the millions of stations in la but exhibit made it all the way down and even when they made it they were either grumpy or they would leave in like 20 minutes but exhibit (laughs) stayed from the beginning of the show he, he took calls and he stayed till the very end of the show. He was the most warm, welcoming, amazing guy. Um, and, and, and it's funny, a uh, follow-up story is later in life, I, I held him in such high regard. Later in life, I tried out to be his DJ for a Russian tour in like 2000, shit, 14? No, 2013. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he ended up hating my guts and fired me. Uh, so that, Why? that, that, that you know, I, I, I don't know. I didn't know his catalog like he wanted me to know his catalog. So I could see why he was upset. But he was a little mo- like a little too upset where he wasn't very nice about it. So I went from like really loving his memory. And I feel like I should have never done that because I held him in such a high regard. Worst interview on college radio. Oh, wow. there was this local group called the Renegades um, that were more like gangster rappers in Orange County. And... Uh, you're not allowed to cut. You could play cuss words, but you can't say cuss words on the mic. And these guys came up to freestyle and I was too scared to say no. They got on the mic and instantly said the F word or the, or shit or whatever. And I kicked them out. And then when they got in their car, I kicked started talking. I, I try. I was like, okay, gotta go. You can't cuss here. And then they left. But then I forgot that you could actually li- like people actually listen to my show. And so me and Jester went back on the air and talk shit about them. And they were listening and in they the came back. Lot. Yeah, and they came back to kick my ass with like baseball bats and uh, weapons. And then um, luckily, one of the other local rappers protected me and uh, convinced them to just leave me alone. But it was a very scary night. Wow. So Exhibit and the Renegades uh, hate you at this point. The best yeah. and the worst. <laughs> That's usually how the things in my life uh, end up. It's usually like no, uh, I never, no. I, I'm never able to get too cocky because I usually fall on my ass shortly after. No, so, uh, I will say everyone loves you. People really, really, really love you. But except for Exhibit and the Renegades. That's funny. I remember I went on UCI radio on probably Rosalind's show. What was that show? Wow. Uh, uh, I forgot the name. They still do it, I think. Um, D DJ Analog and all them. But I remember listening in the parking lot too, before and after. Um, Yeah, yeah. (laughs) DJ uh, Vice also says, how did you get the name Cheap Shot? Um, I don't know if you want to go into that. So after I was DJ Baby C because I was the youngest of my family. So they called me Baby C. And then I hated it because it felt very, you know, you want to be tough. It didn't sound tough. And so then... Like I was rushed into thinking of a replacement name. I thought of DJ Fantasy, like using my C as the name. But it's then when strip, you spell strip it, strip club DJ name. <laughs> yeah, but 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 I spelled it like the soda Fanta dash C, and I realized oh. that the Fanta thing, like the the Fantasy, never really came out. It was more like, why are you the soda, right? And right. so I was like. I needed a D that this was in high school and I needed a DJ name. Then I was also the king of the nerds and one of, and, and one of the small nerds in my crew, he wanted me to fight this guy that was picking on him. And then the smallest, most uncoordinated guy to impress a girl that just dumped him said, no, let me fight this guy. And so he started this fight with this really tall guy and they're fighting and all my friends jump in and all his friends jumped in and I'm standing there frozen 
because I'm in shock that my nerdy friends are in this massive brawl, but the adrenaline was pumping and it felt like I was floating over to the fight. And then one of my friends pushed the main guy towards me and without hesitation, it was just an instinct. I cocked back and I punched him in the side of the head, knocked him out, ended the fight, turned around because I was scared I was going to get in trouble. And a football player goes, Hey man, nice cheap shot. And rather than thinking about anyone's well being or, or, or any, any of things of that sort, is anyone hurt? Is, am I going to be expelled? All I thought was, damn, that's a good DJ name. And then I kept it. Amazing. Wow. Okay. So have you done any other cheap shots since then on people? <laughs> uh, only, uh, no, no, just, I take, like, I would take cheap shots. Like I would buy like the shittiest low shelf liquor and shoot it in my blackouts while DJing. <laughs> Amazing. Um, all right, Ethan. Well, some of these we've answered, but I'll run it by you in case you have any other things to add. Ethan Bicknell says, what was it like working with styles of beyond? I think we went through that. But that, those are my brothers, else. man. I still like it was the best time of my life. A shout outs to Ryu, Talk Beer, Vin Scully. Like uh, it was an amazing thing. So thank you. Nice. Thank you for asking. Um, DJ WS, aka White Shadow, oh, uh, shit. says, Why are you a bitch ass trick? Also, second oh. question What's up, foo? <laughs> okay, I'm a bitch ass trick because I got sober and boring. Uh, I miss White Shadow and I'm so proud of all he's accomplished. I haven't been in touch with him since he's dominated the world. So uh, <laughs> shout out to White Shadow and thanks yes. for caring enough to ask a question. Um, and then the follow up. Um, that's why I'm a bitch ass. And then what, what's the second one? What, what's up? What's Full? up, foo? Yeah. Chilling, man. Chilling. Chilling. Chilling, chilling. Um, okay, we got three more. Three more. Um, two of them from the person that was behind the great video that you and I filmed. You and I did a video, a uh, comedy video, talking about DJing and different styles and funny things with the great Tina T, who runs Camp Spinoff and many other things, another great person. Uh, and it was for Vivo and got all these views and it was hilarious. So much fun to do. It was at my old studio. And Rick Savage was the man behind it. Um, and he writes in two things. He says uh, what a lot of the people have said. Where the fuck did you disappear for for five years? We missed you. Um, as well as also tell us a Shinoda story. Story. he's dreamy so we've gotten some of those in here i think we've covered it but if you got anything anything else to add you can well shout out to rick savage also shout out to dj tina t i haven't talked to her in in befillions of years but um rick is my man even though i haven't seen him in a long time but good shinoda story uh let's see i got so many um Let's see. The good, good Shinoda story would be... He's, he's killing it on Twitch right now, too. Yeah, he did a good job. Like, his pivot into Twitch was, was really interesting to watch. And, of course, but he is, like, you know, I've never met fans. Like, the, the closest thing to Linkin Park fans is New Kids on the Block fans. But I think <laughs> if you're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in dedication and loyalty, I might give it to Linkin Park's fans. Like, those kids are dedicated yeah. um but shinoda let's just say um god i i, I don't want to like i don't want to use the ones that throw them under the bus the, the one I'll, I'll use is um in in london he wasn't there so it's not even a mike shinoda a story but we were at a bar called the monkey bar and these tourists um knew we were somebody and the one of the, the the drunk fellow thought I was Mike Shinoda, and I just said I was. And so for a full night, I convinced this group of like five dudes that I was Mike Shinoda. So that's I don't know. That's not a great story, but it is a story. <laughs> and um, to this day, he has a picture he shows everyone with you. Dude, like, I signed it's autographs. I took photos. I did the whole thing. It was actually it was nice to experience what the the Mike Shinoda life was like for a night. <laughs> that that is nice I used, we used to, I used to do this thing in vegas where we would run up to people and pretend like we thought they were someone else and ask to take a picture with them and they'd be so nice. surprised like yeah sure so i don't know why by I the way that was your funny, airport but... uh magazine 
Like you're the original TikToker, by the way, because that like that shit is legendary. Oh man, I was ahead of my time, right? I but the funny thing is, I try to put those on TikTok and they get zero views or engagement. I don't what? know why. And everyone's like, you need to put those on TikTok. I'm like, I don't know if they have some algorithm to show that like it's from five years ago or something, and they won't show yeah. it to people. But I have, I put some things on TikTok. I put this one thing on. It got like hundreds of thousands of views. I couldn't believe it. A couple of things, but that uh, no, I I still. Have been trying to transition that to the tiktok world and it's not not working i don't know why that's so but thank weird you. yeah people search if you search dj spider mag life the hashtag on um, twitter or instagram especially you'll see me imitating magazine covers for the past 10 years of my life uh, airports all over the world so legendary and some of them are really thing. good impressions like when you go to like because i'll be like that's a weird face and then you go to the magazine and you're like dude spot on actually <laughs> I don't know how. I know someone's like, you've obviously been practicing that for a long time. Like, I have not at all. Why would I be practicing that? You know. Um, thank you. Well, that's my claim to fame. I put it on my Twitch channel. I don't know. Wish that could turn into a show, but that's just my stupid thing that I do. Um, all right. Let's see. Finally, DJ Mr. Best, another great person that yes. I want to come on this show and tell us funny stories one day. Uh, says when's the next bowling league with a laughing oh, face? Wow, that see, I that's, forgot about that. Me too. That was a short-lived uh, venture. But Mr. Best, what's up, man? Like he reached out to compliment Fresh Era, and I, I just it made me realize how much I miss Mr. Best and you know the whole all my DJ friends, man. And and I want to thank you, man, for real. Like I, it's one of my. I'm not saying this again. It's like. W- it's a great podcast you're doing. I think you're doing the world of DJing a real important service. I feel so lucky to be have been on this show, even though I had to invite myself. Uh, super lucky to be a part of it. And just, you know, thank you. And, and I'm proud of all the stuff you're doing. And it's just nice to be able to call myself your friend with such a, you know, you're such a talent and you, you do such awesome things. So thank, thank you. you man. I'm, bl- I'm blushing. Thank you. That, that means a lot coming from you, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, well, yeah, so bowling league, I, yeah, I forgot that even happened, but one day we should all meet up, meet up at pins and, and throw some balls. When I run <laughs> here from La Crescenta, I pass Jewel City Bowling Alley in Glendale, and I just realized they, they, they now have their massive sign that says, we're back. So yeah, bowling alleys are back, baby. Let's go. I know that could be it. Once, uh, whoever wants to get vaccinated is vaccinated. We could meet up there. I mean, not to get political <laughs> people can do what they like, <laughs> um, approach the pandemic, however they like, and then we can throw some balls with masks on. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, amazing. Well, we learned so much about DJ cheap shot on the show today. Thank you. And thank you for all that you're doing and, and what you're doing with stupid fly media, I think is very important as well. And cataloging and documenting what's happening. I see huge things in store for what you're, what you've done already, but what this will become. I, I love what you've done. And I think it's only going to go up and up and, and you're going to connect with so many great people through it. Um, is there any other messages you have for the DJs out there listening that you want to get across or any other final words? words any lessons you've learned you want to pass along in your experience as an no, uh, older all, I, DJ. all i would say like honestly uh, you know vice and i have talked about it. i've talked about it with everybody it's like i've heard the advice for years and i think when i look back on my successes it all comes from being unapologetically myself and following my gut and i think you know i just I, I advise everyone to reach look inside yourself and and ask who you want to become in 10 years and, and just build the path to get there. Like don't, don't take the easy way out or do what everyone else is doing. Just be yourself and find your own path of how to get there. And, uh, I think you'll be, you'll come outside the other, other side, a happier, more fulfilled person. Um, if you want to help this mission of putting the spotlight back on to the golden era rappers, um, you know, just kind of tell people about our first podcast fresh era that's all i can ask spread help me spread the word um and you know if you want to make me feel cool follow at dj cheap shot if you want to uh follow stupid fly it's at stupid fly media and if you want to get extra crazy it's at fresh era podcast but that's bonus points um but thank you spider man it means so much yeah and i think what you just said is an important life lesson to everyone not just djs be yourself 
trust yourself, look inside yourself, analyze what you're doing now, what you want to have happen in the next 10 years. And all of those things are very important lessons that I th sound like common sense or sound like something. Oh, everybody knows that, but I, I don't think so. It's something to be conscious of. So, yo, thank you. I had so much fun talking to you today and I uh, can't wait to keep listening to your podcast and hopefully hang out in the future, maybe collaborate on some things and all oh, of that. Happening. Uh, so let's, let's do it. All right. DJ cheap shot on the 20 podcast. Thank you again. We will see you soon. Peace. The 20 baby. Peace. Oh man. That was so much fun. DJ cheap shot is just the best dude ever. I had so much fun hanging with him, hearing his stories and all that. Uh, so thank you again to cheap shot for coming on the show. Thank you to all of you, the listeners, make sure you keep in touch with me. Hit me on Instagram at DJ spider, DJ S P I D E R or on Twitch. Same thing. Twitch.tv slash DJ spider. Uh, if you want to hit me on Twitter, I'm on there. D E E J A Y S P I D E R. Thank you to the beat sorcerers and everybody that tune in week after week. The 20 Podcast is produced by BeatSource. Join us next week for more interviews as we discuss music that matters to DJs. I'm DJ Spider signing off. Peace.